Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about dog behavior and also the behavior of dog owners. Which one needs to improve the most? We'll find out. My guest today is David Utter. Mr. Utter is the CEO of Dog Evolution TV and he is also a member of the International Association of Canine Professionals. Welcome, David, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I look forward to discussing a lot of topics that usually aren't covered. Very good. Well, let's start by talking about how people that have never had any experience with dogs decide they're going to acquire a dog. So they're very excited about it. They find the dog. They want to love the dog. They want to take the dog out. They want to show off the dog to their friends and so on. But something happens. A few months down the line, they realize the dog's behavior just isn't what they want, isn't what they would like it to be. So mm -hmm. they start to get frustrated, they get disillusioned, and then they blame the dog. Well, what's wrong with that picture, and what needs to happen to correct that situation and allow the owner to have the kind of experience they want to have with that dog? A simple advice I would give people is create a matrix where you draw a line down and just consider study about the breeds on various sites. Don't just rely on one. Try to get as much information and write down the characteristics of the breed, the lifestyle. And then on the other side of the paper, write down your lifestyle. Put down what do you do? Do you, do you go out? Do you like to go to the gym a lot? Do you play tennis a lot? Do you like to run? Are you a triathlete? Do you like time at the beach or trails? And put all the characteristics, how you live, what's the size of you in a tiny apartment? Can you get out efficiently? And put down your lifestyle, your energy levels, and then look at that dog. If you're, does this dog have a high energy level? Does it have a metabolic rate that was meant to go out and chase the sheep and come back, bark at things? Or is it a dog that's kind of a house pet, like a pug that'll watch Netflix with you? Put all that and size it up. Are you compatible with this? Is it, be honest about your personality, the temperament of the personality. Don't try to be something you're not and get a dog that's supposed to have the warrior blood and live vicariously through this dog and then get yourself in trouble. You're not doing justice to the dog. So what you're saying is that people need to do the research before they get the dog. In other words, mm -hmm. understand yourself and your needs and desires and then understand the type of dog that can match that. Correct, because these dogs were not made by accident. Most of them, even if it's a mutt and a mixed breed and you're getting from the shelter, you're looking at that dog's characteristics and that was generations of breeding of what type of dog it is. If you go even to a shelter and you get a ball and you throw it and that dog loves to grab it, bring it back rapidly, constantly to you, that's telling you that's probably a dog that likes to interact constantly with an owner and it's not tiring out easily. You have to ask yourself, Am I prepared to have that kind of energy level? Or do I have a bad back? Do I have a bad knee? Should I get something a little more sedative? Do I have the yard for it? Do I want to communicate with the dog constantly? I can't put it in a cage 10, 12 hours or tie it up. It'll make it aggressive. Well, let's talk about dog signaling and how people get confused or they misinterpret signals that dogs are, are giving. Um, what are some common misperceptions that people have about dog behavior? Yeah, absolutely. We, as humans, we innately want to go down, like in child psychology, you want a job in child psychology, you're going to get an interview and they're going to want to make sure you innately want to go down to the child's level and get and, and non-threatening. But in the dog world, it's a different species, or I wouldn't have a job if everyone just acted human and it worked with their dog. You want to stand up straight. You want to appear strong. You want to come up confident. You want to move into their personal space, not constantly baby talk them because they're, you're interpreting in your tones, those resonant harmonics of your voice are telling the dog, I'm a baby and I'm like you, we're, we're on the same level, we're puppies. And then eventually the dog grows out a puppy, that little eight week old dog could grow to 120 pounds. And if you're still acting babyish, the dog goes, I need to protect you. You're like my younger sibling. So you need to be able to understand that bending down is not helping the situation, constantly making it the petting zoo and touching it every second. They're not used to that in this species. And as humans, we tend to make it the petting zoo for a psychological approach because it makes us feel good, but that doesn't necessarily make a balanced brain on the dog. Well, you, you've brought up a good point, and that is the fact that dogs are pack animals. Mm. And they come from a pack, and they believe in a hierarchy of relationships within that pack, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they definitely know that, and, and we talk about alpha dogs and beta dogs and in-between dogs and so forth. So how does the owner uh, establish who's in charge here in that relationship? First relationship is dogs look at spatial relationships. So the room you're standing in, the, the yard you're in, whatever's in there immediate, they're living in now and the present. They're not like us, clustered with a lot of future thoughts. 
So they're going to sit there and look at you and say, do you come in and lean into me on, on spaces? Do you just lightly walk into me and push me out of the way to get the chair you wanted? All these are normal dog signals. It's not mean and cruel to the animal. They speak loudly. It's just like going to Italy. They speak loud. They're, you know, it's not that they're mad. So you have to look at the dog the same way. They like to use their body language and clip each other in the shoulder and push each other or, or lean against each other or use different voice inflections or be more stubborn and don't, don't just do something once maybe continuous through the day you're giving those reminders now the dog sees you as a protector and will actually love you more and that goes back to body language and space relationship I'm the alpha now well when we talk about training dogs it's better to train them when they're young so they grow up with the training is that correct correct yes because you are actually reducing the amount of physical influence and force just like child you want to influence them in those critical years when they're younger one to five then never enforce the word no and wait till they're 13 and you're, you're getting back at your front door with the cops right <laughs> so you want to influence that puppy when it's young so you can be a lot more gentle later down the road so if people pick up dogs from the <clears throat> shelter and the dog's already three or four years old, um, <clears throat> what about that situation? Is it, is it workable? It's absolutely workable, but it's like anything. When I, I work with many child psychologists and uh, autistic children and training dogs, they all agree. You just have to do a lot more hard work. There's a lot more elbow grind. You have to be, accept the fact you're doing a humanitarian job. You're taking on a project more than a puppy. And absolutely, I've taken the worst dogs and turned them around and seen them on social media with little kids and they're no longer aggressive and they're playful, but it may be five, six, eight months, depending on the dog, of consistent hard work to save that dog's life and balance the brain. But you need to know what you're doing. You need professional help to not get frustrated. Well, while we're talking about it, how long does it take to train a dog and how much consistency do you need to have? And also, how much do you have to engage in the training process when you first start? Usually you're looking at two to three weeks of a lot of consistency. I tell clients, just mark it on your calendar, block everything out and dedicate every day to spending hours with that dog before work, after work, tethering the dog to your waist, walking around the house, making that imprint. Two to three weeks a dog can learn what its basics are. But now for it to become a part of what I call the knowledge, we were talking about like Einstein's theory, information is one thing, knowledge is another. Then to get that, you've got to get at least 120 days because your nervous ce nerve cells have glial cells. And just like in human rehabilitation or boot camp, those glial cells adjust to become habitual. So when you get out to about 120 days training a dog, a dog is now habitually smiling and going, I love my job. You're no longer having to constantly be vigilant. Right, and, and so when we talk about training, uh, being consistent and staying with the dog and staying on it, and, and so the dog has expectations, when should we start to see progress? You said two or three weeks. Um, Correct. When, when, are we, when do we know when we're there? Well, you're looking for cues in the dog's eyes. So dogs leaning into position because they're not humans, they're reading and leaning into a position. The eye tension on the muscles start to become focused. The tail position can be confusing. A lot of people say it's a wagging tail. It's a safe dog. Police dogs attack all the time with a wagging tail. I have many dogs on my social media site and many other professional trainers. Wagging dogs can be attacking. So you want to not rely on that. You, and, or tail position going down between the legs, insecure dog, definitely. Or a dog that's just nervous because they're learning something new. So that doesn't always mean you're in a bad situation. But when the dog's finally got a tail that's mid-range or dropped or out a little bit up and just a light wag, with more I read the eyes and the ears and the relaxes, it's also like being an EMT or a medic. You're looking for the respiratory. If the breathing's smooth, the tongue is smooth, I call it the puppy expression. If they have that consonance of just a <laughs> cute, you know you're in a good zone because they're now accepting their role. Well, if we're talking about dog motivation, what actually motivates dogs? What do they think about and do they have a long-term memory? They absolutely do have a long-term memory. Uh, that's a, lot, a misnomer when people say, no, they're only just in the now because you'll see a lot of brilliant poodles. They'll be good all the time, but if they did have an accident in the house, you come home and they're hiding and they don't come out because they know they did something wrong or they chewed at the screen. So that's an example. You develop the long-term memory. It's just like a child. A lot of kids get accused of being ADHD and they're really not. They're just creative. They have to learn how to harness their energy and focus it. So that's the same thing with a dog. They're, they're a reactive animal, but when you actually continuously show them how to control their energy, they actually do learn long-term memory. And what, what do they think about most of the time? What motivates them? 
Uh, usually play and interaction, kind of like the emotions of a child. So balls, toys, uh, food I don't use as a manipulation because that's not something that's coming from within the animal to behave. I want to behave from within. I'm not going to manipulate as a trade-off. So I'm usually motivating them with toys, my voice, my body language, being jumpy, being excited, like a kindergarten teacher. And so if, if I have a dog that is doing something that I don't want them to do and they've developed a, a habit or a pattern of doing that, mm. how do I break that pattern? So just like you would do with the child, you want to not avoid it. I see most dog trainers, they're avoiding and they, they, it's kind of a cop out. They'll go to the other side of the street. They'll just say, I'll put you in a cage. Dogs really don't understand a timeout. They'll just enjoy their timeout or maybe not. You want to introduce them to what's bothering them consistently saying, see that? You touch it, no, it's off limits with your tone, with the shifting them off their body weight and their language, and then give them a lot of pets on the tummy and the back. I do a 70-30 ratio, a lot of love with 70%, 30% correction. Then let's reintroduce. Now remember, the art of dog training is always knowing to not flood the brain and do downtime so that their brain can relax and then re-understand re like what you just introduced them to them. That's when you see the benefit. Do people lose timing with the dog and they get frustrated and that's because they don't know how to cycle the the learn relax learn relax so are we really trying to get the dog to go beyond his or her instincts and listen to the owner and the commands of the owner is that the is that the goal absolutely because otherwise we'd have hunting dogs that wouldn't return they would <laughs> keep hunting right <laughs> so when they just say a dog just let it be a dog but uh, as my instructor said many years ago, I never forgot, he says when people would accuse him of that, saying, well, it's not the dog's instincts. How many kids at five years old don't want to look out the window and go play? <laughs> it's their instinct to do it. It's not to be working in film or be a professor here in the university. You're introducing things and stimulating the brain to discover who they are. Well, uh, speaking of things that dogs do, there are three common complaints about dogs. Mm -hmm. One is they bark too much two, they bite people, and three, they jump on people. And I've seen dogs jump on people because they're trying to show aggression, mm -hmm. but I've also seen dogs jump on people because they're happy to see them. Um, they're just excited. Mm -hmm. So we only have about a minute left in this segment. Uh, how can we address those three behaviors, barking too much, biting and jumping, and uh, how can we correct that situation? Quickly, you move them into the situation, use a leash because our human reaction's too slow, introduce them as they're barking, you want to have cues, and those cues should be your vocals. It should be your body language leaning into them. Uh, parents, dog parents, when they're correcting, they'll grab a nose and a snout, just where the gentle leaders you see go on the nose. Well, a lot of people say that's just, uh, you know, it's, it's positive reinforcement using gentle leaders. Actually not. They have a nerve on their nose. If you're pressing down, you have to remember dogs are doing that for 150 million years. They're pressing down on the nose. They're pushing the dog off balance to the point where it's, you're vexing the dog. You're annoying. And at that point, the dog's starting to back off. But that's dog language. They don't look at it as mean. Then when they stop, you're rubbing their tum tummy. So I would do that if they're jumping. Knock them off their equilibrium because in, in a carnivore world, that means checkmate. You won. So it's just like paying sports. If I constantly keep you off balance in a contact sport, I'm gonna win. So that I would use just as a general theory to understand people. If you wanna to get to a dog's mind and stop humanizing them, observe dogs, what are they doing? All right, on that note, we do have to go to the break. So stay tuned, when we come back, we'll talk about why dogs become emotionally attached to humans. Stay with us. Dad? Being a dad can be transformative. <gasps> but also a lot of fun. Help prepare your little monster for the outside world. Encourage their interests. Support their growth. Walk them through new relationships. He's perfect. Whatever you say. And prepare them to stand on their own two feet. So much of the good in my life is because of you. Never stop being a dad. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, and my guest today is David Utter. We're talking about dog training and dog behavior. 
So David, before we went to the break, we talked about all the things that dogs do that we have to correct or work with or train against or get them to overcome their, their instincts. But now I'd like to spend some time talking about the good things that dogs do for us and some of the things that dogs are amazing in their ability to perform. And, but let's first talk about dogs being sensitive to certain stimulus or stimuli, such as earthquakes, such as lightning and thunder and so on. It seems that dogs anticipate these things in advance. Why is that happening? Well, don't forget the whole universe is about magnetic pulse and animals are gonna take the path of least uh, resistance in biology. So they're going to approach life from feeling magnetic pulse like a full moon and tides and hunting and like even in criminology, they see that with a full moon. So you're going to have to accept the fact that they're gonna to respond to each other and sense a change in magnetic pulse. They're more sensitive to it. So that's where we've seen them. But like in any human or animal, some people are better at art, some people are better at math. You'll meet dogs that are more genetically in tuned to picking this up. But we see this in many species, migratory animals, animals such as whales and dolphins and birds and the way they, they can navigate around the world is the same thing. It's based on a magnetic pulse. So this is the, the, that in a quick short. Right, and there was a, a pretty terrible earthquake in Turkey and Syria the other mm -hmm. day, and uh, I saw a video on YouTube where someone had captured the activity of birds prior to the earthquake, and the birds were just going crazy. So that validates everything you're saying. Correct. And um, in the dog world, we also know that uh, dogs have this ability to become very attached to humans. So what is it about dogs that enables them to become emotionally involved and attached to humans? And uh, in, in the process of becoming attached, why do they become man's best friend? Because humans tend to let down their guard with an animal. Uh, whatever's happened in your past, you still let your guard down because you can see the innocence and love in a dog. So we therefore, we open our heart and our mind to that dog in every moment and that in return, the dog can sense our sincerity. And so we tend to build a very sincere bond. Too bad we don't do that openly to human, to human all the time and just get rid of all the garbage out of your head and, and be in the present. Because that's why dogs and humans tend to bond. Besides the fact, uh, the size of the animal, the affection, the, the fuzziness of them, their playfulness, they bring a smile to our lives. Right, and I think we talked before the program about horses and how people become attached to their horses, but we can't have the same level of attachment to a horse that we can mm. to a dog because of the physical, the sheer physical size of the horse. Absolutely, a poop bag would be like a trash can. <laughs> <laughs> so as we see dogs becoming um, emotionally attached to their owners, they can anticipate uh, owners, how they're going to react to certain things. They become very sensitive and maybe even anxious when their owners are upset. Uh, we see that often. Again, is that tied to what you were talking about just a moment ago about energy levels and things of that nature? Yes, many soldiers I've worked with down in Camp Pendleton before with their PTSD issues, they sense their energy, how to know when to come in comfort and be at your side to soothe you. And again, the, the soldiers trusting the energy of the animal, that's the one thing they can, they can actually let their guard down. So we see a lot of that emotionally. We see it in autistic kids as well. Um, and there's a whole field of that, that, of especially finding an animal that does naturally want to connect with you. And when we talk about dogs um, helping humans, there are a lot of dogs that actually do work for humans. Uh, we, hunting dogs, for example, and there are sheep herding dogs or cattle herding dogs and that sort of thing, as well as the bomb sniffing dogs or drug sniffing dogs. So why do dogs want to work for humans? What do they get out of it? Well, they like the job because we're actually, we took and just rebred these dogs enough to find the ones that actually like that, what we call prey drive, that hunting instinct. And then we learn to work with those instincts and modify the behavior of the instincts for our own self needs to keep the sheep in the middle or to do bomb detection instead of finding a, a carcass or, or finding food. So when we do that, the dog is given a job and they're already come into the world wanting this job. Their metabolic rate in working breeds is much faster than you would see in a pug who wants to just watch TV. These dogs that are like German Shepherds, Australian cattle dogs, Malinois, etc., hunting dogs, hounds, have that, that high energy. They don't like to sit idle, so a personality of someone who likes to utilize that um, and use that even in play and hide treats and toys and bushes and balls, this is exactly what the dog needs. 
Well, and we also talk about dogs being capable of uh, engaging in very heroic behavior, actually. If a building is on fire, they wake up all the residents in the building, um, and they're used in wartime to drag soldiers to safety under fire. Uh, they, they walk the point mm -hmm. um, in the jungles to detect the booby traps and that sort of thing. And they also can drag people, like I said, they drag people to safety, but they just seem to want to help out um, in those cases. Why do they do that? If they're doing that, it's because they have developed a bond and an intuition to feel a part of human groups. So remember, I always say humans are tribal and dogs are pack, but the same mentality can blend. So that's why we became a perfect partners in early days, 35,000 years ago, hunting. So they want to help you because they can see that you're cooperating in this hunt. So they see the need they need to eat. They see the need for protection or shelter. So they, it's a very easy flowing symbiotic relationship. And so dogs are well suited to this. Um, mm -hmm. What is it about dogs that can do this that other animals can't? Why dogs? Because of the training that you just mentioned of, of training the wolves to become part of uh, the human community? Yes, you can always find uh, when you're genetically selecting, looking, you're looking for that wolf that wants to be a part of uh, human society more than the other wolves. They don't have the same shyness problems of some of the other wild dog animals. There's always gonna be a genetic tweak that you're gonna see that dog likes being around humans and that's where you start the breeding program. And that's how humans eventually evolved into modern day domestic breeds. Well, when we talk about dogs and uh, the types of breeds that are out there, I know you've trained uh, all kinds of dogs, just about everything imaginable. So uh, what part of the dog training is consistent or sort of universal for all breeds? And where does it start to splinter off into specific training for various applications? Well, they're first going to be like a simple, uh, like when we were little kids, you do have somewhat of an Ivan Pavlov conditional response, but you can't stay there because we'd all be robotic, even as humans, if we stayed there. So then you have to start giving selections and decisions for an animal to make a search and look for something or watch me for a cue, uh, whether it's a body language cue. So that's how we develop the, the mind to expand out. So I will take working breeds they're gonna be more forceful because they're genetically met like people who play contact sports aren't gonna be the same as the chess champion in what their desires are in life. So I, the, I see it as, as a contact sport animal because that's who they are. They're carnivores, they hunt, they're tough. And then I'm gonna look at the dog like the pug or the little Pekingese or you know a Yorkie and say that this is the pet quality. They can have similarities, but they're not gonna have this strong of recessive genes as the working class. Well, let's go back to uh, something you mentioned earlier uh, at the beginning of the program about how people should do research on the type of dog that would fit within the lifestyle that, that those owners want to live. So for the average city dweller, um, average city dweller meaning having limited space, uh, not having a big backyard necessarily, uh, or, and certainly not a ranch or a farm, what kind of dogs are appropriate and also for families, young families that want to have a dog that they can love and have fun with, what are the best kind of breeds for that? We've seen a lot of big uh, pickup and popularity of the doodle breeds, but they're by no means equal. Labradoodles, golden doodles are excellent choice. Australian, Australian Labradoodles, a, a mid-size to small size. It was bred originally for working with like autism and kids. So it tends to be very a gentle dog. I enjoy those. A silly pug, it's not too smart, but it makes us laugh. It's also a good one to go. Um, you know, Dotsons are little feisty guys, but it's if you've got the feisty personality, but you don't want a dog that needs that much exercise. Terriers can be very challenging, uh, need more exercise. So even though they're small, that doesn't mean relative to what the lifestyle of yours is. So you do have to be careful when you choose those breeds. What about uh, dogs that seem so cute, but yet they can be a real headache if you don't know how to train them? What, what breeds would fit into that category? Huskies are gonna be one of the top of the list. They belong in a glacier, probably not in, in a warm climate. Uh, they're meant to be pulling. They're extremely intelligent. They'll probably outsmart most humans today. So you have to be prepared to have that Husky. They have a sense of humor. Uh, Belgian Malinois, uh, Dutch Shepherds, very cousin, same similar thing. Eastern Shepherds, very high metabolic rate. Do not try to go look up the best bloodline of a police dog and follow some movie and, and live vicariously through that. It's not going to work out. Well, what are the breeds that you prefer? Do you have preferences for breeds? I know you train all dogs, and mm. you don't want to make it seem like you prefer others, uh, some to others, uh, but which are the breeds that you like? 
Um, I would say, you know, for general public, I like these uh, um, doodles, but stay away from some of the other doodles that can be more stubborn, like Bernie's doodles and sheep doodles can be a little more stubborn. It's a great breed. Ones I like are going to be moving more into uh, golden retrievers, Labradors, uh, but don't get a hunting line Labrador because he's going to have too much energy for your family and tear your screen down and he's going to be too strong. So again, I like a lot of breeds, but you have to look at your physical strengths. Uh, if you're handicapped in some way or your personality, are you willing to be physically more firm? So uh, I could look at a uh, Corky and, and love it, but they can also be stubborn and food possessive. So you, I would say a lot of poodles are great for people, but a standard poodle will probably outsmart you and they were hunting dogs as well. And what about pit bulls? You hear different things about pit mm -hmm. bulls. The, of course, the reputation is that they're mean and nasty and will attack. Mm -hmm. What's the truth? About pit Truth bulls. behind it is most of them that are attacking are not pure pit bulls. A real pit bull is actually a small animal, females 45 to 55 pounds, males 60 to 75 pounds at best, and they love humans and you, it's difficult to get them to attack. They're wonderful. The ones that are being mixed with bulldogs, American bulldogs, Mastiff breeds are the larger breeds you're seeing out there. And the truth of the matter is they're still excellent dogs, but it's like any dog, you need to know how to, you need someone who specializes in dogs that are powerful and have that intuition to hunt and bite and, or play too hard biting. You take children, you train them contact sports within a rule parameter so they don't hurt the other kids. Same thing with training a pit bull, you need someone who knows what they're doing. What about dogs that are very hyper and uh, the owners decide to give them some sort of medication to mellow them out? Is, uh, is that a good idea or not? Cruelty to animals. It's mm -hmm. my philosophy. Simple and cruelty to animals. It's like I made a comment about ADHD children. I, 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 I prefer to work with the gene pool and learn how to, ch it's like martial arts, teach them to control the temper, control the energy. To just say I'm going to medicate you, you're still miserable sitting on the dog bed. Mm. It's narcissism. Right. What about the opposite direction where people just spoil their dogs and they just let their dogs do whatever they want? Are humans doing dogs any favors by spoiling them or do the dogs actually prefer a more structured kind of relationship with their owners? They all prefer structure regardless of breed, going back to your question of breeds that cross over. Simple little breeds to, to working breeds to pet breeds are all going to need structure. They're like children. They're going to feel safe. Most of my clients that come to me, 95% of them at least, the dogs have behavioral problems because the human has spoiled them and now the dog feels insecure, feels entitled, and is biting. And on that note, we'll close the program because we have run out of time, but this has been fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Talking Points. Be sure to join us again soon for the next episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.